Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Number 13, Sunday, November 27, 2016. The lesson is entitled Alpha and Omega. The lesson comes from Revelations chapter 22, verses 12 through 21. We were asked to read Revelations chapter 22, verses 8 through 21. The place is from Patmos. The time is 96 A.D. The lessons in this final unit have taken us through Revelation 21 and 22. We discovered how Christ will make all things new, and we have marveled at the new Jerusalem and the river of life in the eternal city. This final lesson is a fitting conclusion to our study of the sovereign Christ as we worship him, the Alpha and Omega, who is coming to take us to be with him someday. Our passage leads us to stay to say with John, even so, come Lord Jesus, Revelations 22, 20. Today's aim, facts, to understand more about the eternal nature of Christ from his names. Principle, to think more frequently about the return of Christ, the Alpha and Omega. Application, to worship Christ as the eternal one, as the one who is coming soon. Illustrating the lesson. We should look forward to the return of the Alpha and Omega. Golden text. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Revelation 22, 13. Today we have three lesson outlines. One, a declaration of sovereignty. Revelations 22, 12 through 16. Second, a declaration of responsibility. Revelation 22, 17 through 19, and the third, a final benediction, Revelations 22, 20 through 21. Introduction. God's sovereignty is clearly portrayed in his dealings with Israel. His, he directed the steps of the patriarchs, turned evil to good in the life of Joseph, and prospered his people in Egypt. He displayed his power in the Exodus, the wilderness journeys, and the conquest of Canaan. He showed his hand of blessing in times of obedience and of judgment in times of apostasy, using foreign powers to achieve his will. God revealed his sovereignty in bringing his son into the world, working through his miracles and providing salvation through his death and resurrection. He continues to work sovereignly through his church and will conclude history in a blaze of judgment and glory. Yet his deeds in the affairs of man are only a speck on the ocean of eternity. He was sovereign before our world existed and will be so always. This week's lesson may provide a glimpse of that eternal authority. A declaration of sovereignty. Revelations 22 verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. 15. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. Sovereign God over history and eternity. Revelations 22, 12 through 13. The verses before us today are part of the epilogue to the book of Revelation. In verses 6 through 12, we saw the Lord give his final word to his church in light of the many visions John has recorded. Jesus has already declared that he will return quickly, verse 7. And in the light of this, there will be no further opportunity for change when his coming occurs, verse 11. Verse 11. 
Now he repeats his declaration, and behold, I come quickly, Revelations 22, 12. This does not mean that he would return soon after John completed his writing, but that once the end time events began, his return will swiftly come and take many people by surprise. Matt 24, 32 to 34, 36 to 39, 42 through 44. So preparation cannot be put off. To the promise of his swift return, Jesus adds, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelations 22, 12, Isaiah 40, 10, 62, 11. Reward means that which is due and it's connotation can be either favorable or unfavorable. It is related here to the moral conditions enumerated in the previous verse. Jesus will deal with every person according to his deeds. Those transformed by faith in Christ will be rewarded. Those still bound in sin will suffer his judgment. This is as it should be. For Jesus declares, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, Revelations 22, 13. Alpha and Omega are the letters that begin and end the Greek alphabet. Applied figuratively, they stand for whatever is first and last in any situation. It would formerly be impossible for any one thing to be both Alpha and Omega, for they stand at opposite ends of a series. However, God can be accurately described as both, for he is infinite in relation to time. This divine attribute is described in various ways in scripture. Genesis 21, 33, Psalms 92, 1 Tim 6, 16. Revelation uses several phrases of him. He is the one who is, was, and is to come. 1, 4, 8, chapter 4, verse 8. In the beginning and the end. Chapter 21, verse 6. Chapter 22, verse 13. And the first and the last. Chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 8. Chapter 22, verse 13. The term Alpha and Omega occurs several times in Revelation. In 1.8, it most likely refers to the Father. In 1.11, it could refer to either the Father or the Son. In 21.6, it definitely refers to the Father. And in 22.13, it is definitely the Son. There will always be some who question Jesus' eternal nature and equality with the Father. But these texts assert that they are equal in eternal existence. Jesus is all that the Father is, and he is sovereign over eternal ages, sovereign over human destinies. Revelations 22, 14 through 15. At this point, the speaker presumably changes <clears throat> from Christ to John who announces the destinies of two groups. First, a blessing is pronounced on those who do his commandments. There is a difference of readings in the ancient Greek manuscripts with some of some of them reading those who wash their robes. This alternate reading agrees with the similar declaration in Revelation 7:14. These are they which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. It also avoids the error that it is possible to earn merit to enter into God's presence. Ephesians 2:8 through 9. Yet even if we choose the first reading, we have Jesus's own statement that the work of God is to believe on him whom he hath sent, John 6, 29. Those washed in his blood have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city, Revelations 22, 14. The word for light means authority or privilege. It is the word translated power in John 1, 12. Through Jesus' blood, they will have free access to the heavenly city through its 12 open gates, Revelations 21, 12 and 25, and to the health giving properties of the tree of life therein, 22, 2. Christ also determines the destiny of the wicked. John makes it unavoidably clear that they are outside the holy city, excluded from its blessings. They are those condemned at the judgment 
of the great white throne and cast into the lake of fire, 20, 11 through 15. There is no place for unbelievers in the new Jerusalem, 21, 8, 27. And the time for repentance is past. The evil persons left outside are enumerated in Revelations 22, 15. Dogs is a particularly offensive designation. As animals, they frequent the slums of cities. They become the symbol of all that is unclean and impure. In the Old Testament, this was the term used for male prostitutes. Deuteronomy 23:18, And more, more generally for all, that was unclean and despised. Second Samuel's three eight, chapter nine verse eight, chapter sixteen verse nine, and Job chapter thirty verse one. Jesus so described the profane. Matthew chapter seven verse six, and Paul so identified Judaism teachers. Philippians three two. Also excluded from the holy city are sorcerers. These are those who practice magical arts by use of drugs, spells, and witchcraft. Such things are part of the wicked world Christ will judge. Revelations 9, 21, 18, 23, and will have no place in God's new order. Chapter 21, verse 8, <clears throat> whoremongers. Chapter 22, verse 15, are strictly speaking of those who practice prostitution, but the term also refers generally to sexually immoral persons. Ephesians 5.5, 5, 1 Tim 1.10, Hebrews 13.4. The exclusion of murderers speaks for itself. God will not tolerate the presence of those who so violate his goodness and love. Idolaters also will be excluded. He cannot sanction those who give their worship to, uh, to another. Finally, anyone who loves and practices a lie will be banned. Here the condemnation includes the attitude as well as the action. One who loves lying engages in it habitually and does so not just in words but in deceitful actions. God's heavenly city cannot abide such pretense. Anything short of transparency in motive and deed will be unacceptable there. Sovereign over his people, Revelations 22, 16. Our Lord now speaks again with the emphatic, I, Jesus, his authority is evident in his affirmation. I have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Though John was the immediate recipient of these words, the you is plural in Greek, indicating a message for all the churches. He thus authenticates the entire book of Revelation as being for the prophet of the churches. At the beginning, Christ instructed John to write down his visions for seven specific churches in the Roman province of Asia, Revelations 1.11, 17 through 20. He then gave instructions to each of these churches, chapters 2 through 3, and revealed events of the end times in the rest of the book. By application, all churches throughout this age are the recipients of this message as well, and we will be wise to heed it. This is especially important in light of who Jesus is. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star, Revelations 22, 16. This is a pronouncement that he is the divine Messiah of Israel, Isaiah 11, 1 and 10. That is, he is the descendant of David is, of course, without question, Matt 1, 1, Romans 1, 3. But calling himself the root of David implies he is much more than this. He is also David's creator and Lord, Matt 22, 42 through 45. While Jesus is David's heir to the throne on the human level, he, is also, he also is the eternal God, Isaiah 9, 6, John 8, 58. Jesus also called himself the bright and morning star, Revelations 22, 16. As the morning star heralds the onset of the new day, Jesus heralds the, the bright new day of God's eternal glory. He did so at his first coming through the light of the gospel of grace, 2 Timothy 1, 10, and his second coming will signal the dawning of the glorious day of eternity, a declaration of responsibility. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come, 
and let him that heareth say come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Verse 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which were written in this book responsibility to heed God's invitation, Revelation 22, 17. The final message of the book is an invitation for the thirsty to partake of the water of life. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, could possibly be an appeal to Jesus to hasten his coming, verses 12 and 20. But this interpretation would require a sharp break with the rest of the verse. It thus seems better to take the entire verse as an evangelistic invitation. The first to invite the thirsty to come and the spirit and the bride. These are the Holy Spirit and the church speaking as one. Second, one who hears echoes their invitation. This could be either an individual church member or an unbeliever answering the invitation himself and urging, and urging others to join him. The urgent call goes out while there is still time. The invitation is simple and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. Revelations 22, 17. The water of life is the eternal life that Christ gives. John 4, 13 through 14, 6, 35, 7, 37 through 39. He gives it freely without money and without price. Isaiah 55, 1, to all who thirst for it. This, of course, is the one prerequisite for receiving salvation. Jesus quenches the thirst of all who come to him, but he can do nothing for those who are not thirsty. Responsibility to honor God's revelation. Revelation 22, 18 through 19. The book of Revelation ends with a solemn warning not to tamper with the words God has given. The warning is addressed to any that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book and then either adds to or subtracts from them. While it is a dire matter to alter any part of God's word, Deuteronomy 4.2, Proverbs 36, Jeremiah 26, 2. This warning pertains specifically to the prophecies given in Revelation. Those who add to it will be subject to the plagues it foretells, and those who take away from it will forfeit the right to God's blessings. They are condemned not for some minor or in, in, inadvertent alteration of the text, but for a defiant attitude that rejects the message God has given. By adding human conditions for salvation or minimizing his condemnation of sin, they are assuming they are wiser than God, and this cannot and this he cannot tolerate. Final benediction. Verse twenty He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Verse 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you all. Amen. Revelation ends with the final statement by Jesus Christ and a response by John. He which testifieth these things, 2220, is Jesus. At the beginning of the book, the content is said to be the testimony of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 10. He is called the faithful witness, 1, 5, and 3, 4. Through angels, though angels bring the revelation to John, it is ultimately the message of Jesus they convey. He vouches for its truthfulness, chapter 22, verse 6 through 7, for he himself is faithful and true, chapter 19, verse 11. For the third time in this chapter, Jesus declares, I come quickly, Revelations 22, 20. Verses 7 and 12. As noted earlier, this does not mean he would return shortly after these words were written. It means that once the events foretold began to occur, he would come at any time. Furthermore, his coming would be widely unexpected and sudden. 
Surely this threefold repetition should be taken as a warning against unpreparedness. He leaves all men without excuse. John responded to Jesus' words with a prayer. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Revelations 22, 20. Amen is a Hebrew expression that gives accent to what has just been spoken. Thus, John expressed agreement with the Lord's promise to come quickly. And he went even further, repeating as a fervent hope that he might return soon. John's hope is similar to that expressed in the in the word Maranatha. 1 Corinthians 16, 22 a transliteration of the aromatic words for our Lord come. Early Christians prayed this prayer as a part of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Are we as fervent as they in our expectation of Jesus' intimate return? John's final words to his readers are a benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with you all. Amen. Revelations 22, 21. It is rather surprising ending to an, ap an ap apocalyptic. Its similarity and personal nature seems out of place after the figurative descriptions in the vision. Yet we must remember that the book was written as a letter to a group of churches under John's care, chapter 1, verse 11. And it is these Christians to whom he gave his benediction. The words are similar to those at the end of Paul's epistle, Romans 16, 24. Philippians 4.23, they are surely appropriate for those who have read the stark contrast of God's judgments on the wicked and his blessings on the redeemed. It is only by the grace of Jesus Christ that any escape eternal doom and enter eternal bliss. It is that same grace that must sustain us in our earthly journey. The sovereign God is also gracious and for that we give thanks. Questions. One, how is Jesus' promise of his swift return both an encouragement and a warning? Two, what is the significance of Jesus calling himself Alpha and Omega? Three, those excluded from the heavenly city are called dogs. Revelations 22.15, why? Four, to whom was Revelations written? Why does this imp what does this imply for us? Five, Jesus is called the root and the offspring of David, verse 16. What does this tell us about him? Six, how is Jesus like the morning star heralding a new day? Seven, what is the evangelistic purpose of revelation? Who will respond? Eight, why is it such a serious matter to add to or subtract from the book of Revelations. Nine, how did John respond to Jesus' promise to return quickly? Ten, what encouraging message does the benediction of Revelation con convey? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 27, 2016. Thank you for listening. God bless.